Thanks. It's an honor to be here, and I thank you all for uh, also taking your time to be here. A little personal story since we, they were talking about urban wildlife. I have a daughter uh, who I took to kindergarten for the first time this year, and uh, we were walking to school, and there were police surrounding the school. And I thought, oh, you know, some, some crazy person. And I asked the principal, and the principal said, no, 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 there are just four black bears surrounding the school, so we wanted to make sure the children get there safely. And um, community pride, Bozeman loves you know, to tell stories like that. So um, I've been tasked with the small task of giving you, you know, an enormous background of science and, and what does it say about conservation. And what I hope is that it tells uh, a story that's a little bit more than just commonsensical. Uh, for those of you who can't read this, it says, keep off the grass. Um, so hopefully we'll do a little bit more than that. And in fact, what I'm going to do is talk a little bit, just give you a very brief background of my own organization, the Wildlife Conservation Society. I'll give you an overview of some of the basic principles of science. I'm going to really pick and choose to the, those that are relevant to what's happening today. And then I'll take you through a few examples of how science can move into implementation. And then finally, I'll, I'll just briefly talk about some of the science needs that are out there to continue to inform conservation and management. So who is WCS? We're an old organization founded by, I think he said, one of the, a bunch of those old white dead guys. Um, we work around the world, uh, and one of our, our mission is saving wild places and wildlife. So we've worked to establish over 130 reserves around the world, including 30 in North America from the Arctic Refuge to Wind Caves National Park and many, many more. We also work on specific conservation of spe species around the world in North America um, that has uh, involved some of the seminal research on species like eagles and bighorn sheep and cougars. Um, and translating that to things like the International Bird Migratory Act and the Pribilof Fur Seal Treaty and so forth. One of the themes that you're going to hear about is, is that, for me, science is also about inspiration. The pictures up there are pictures of three primate species discovered in the last seven years just by my colleagues. There are still wild places around the world, and there are still discoveries, whether it's new species or whether it's about behavior. And I would argue that that role of science, whether it's biological science or whether it's space shuttle science or other types of science, is really important in driving human societies forward. So one of the things that science does at, at a very basic level is it, it sort of notices and documents patterns. And so what you're looking at is, in fact, um, a picture of the world at night. And the brighter spots are those higher density lights. Um, and yeah, wow, exactly. Um, but what does that really mean? Science can go a little bit further and sort of take those types of trends, um, human density trends, road, um, road development, energy development, and different kinds of things, and begin to start to look at global patterns, things like the level of human footprint. Um, and that can also help inform conservation, right? What are those places that have lower human footprint where we might want to invest uh, resources. And we can also take that kind of information and those kinds of patterns and look at it more locally. This is uh, my home here up in Bozeman, and this is the Greater Yellowstone Ecosystem and Grand, uh, Grand Teton National Park and Yellowstone National Park. And we can start to look at um, patterns of human development within an area that some people call the Greater Yellowstone Ecosystem. And in fact, get to things like what's happening with human populations. And it turns out that humans are not settling so much in towns. They're, they've watched a river runs through it, and they're buying a piece of a river runs through it. And so they're spreading further away. Um, and one can look at the, you know, what kinds uh, scientists can then look at not only what those human patterns are, but how those human patterns and behaviors affect wildlife distribution. So this is an example of. Uh, current and historic carnivore distribution, and what you can see is that you know clearly um, carnivores and ungulates were uh, or hoofed animals were more widely distributed in the past than they are now, um, and so we can get to these patterns. 
And in fact, once, you know, as scientists we look at patterns, what we then move towards is theories. And I'm going to give you three graphs. You guys can try to figure them out. I'm not going to explain them. Otherwise, you can ignore them and listen to my words. So as we notice patterns, we develop theories. One of the founding theories in conservation biology is the theory of island biogeography. And what I want you to do is that you can either look at the uh, graphs and figure them out, or you can listen to my words, which is basically what this says, is if you have a mainland and you have a series of islands off of that mainland, and you're looking at how many species are in that entire ecosystem, how might they be distributed across the islands? And it, it turns out that somewhat to our common sense that those islands that are bigger and closer to the mainland are more likely to have more of the species that appear on the mainland, right? They're more likely to get to those islands, the islands are bigger, and so they're more likely to sustain those species. This kind of theory has then been applied to terrestrial systems, and I'll talk about that in a second, but it's also been adapted to something called metapopulation theory. And this is a, you know, and, and I'm not going to talk much about theory, so just hang in there with me. Um, this sort of says, well, it's not, um, you know, all terrestrial environments. One, there tends to be permeability um, between, let's say, if you were looking at um, mountain chains and you, and you wanted to know how um, species get from one mountain chain to another, well, they, they, you know, it's not an ocean, and so many species can move back and forth. And also the configuration might not be just a mainland and islands, but more patchy, and, and what's shown below are different kinds of metapopulations. Um, and, it, and it turns out that these are pretty important in terms of understanding how species are distributed and how they might be likely to just be distributed as human populations sort of develop around, for example, protected areas and what might happen to species. My last graph. And it turns out that um, scientists have done a fairly good job of beginning to assess that, in fact, when we look at core areas and national parks being one of them, that species are disappearing from our U.S. western parks. And, um, and there's reasons for this. Um, and, the re and, and, and in fact, when you, know, you look at the science, they come up with things like the, that the, the isolation of a national park from other core areas, whether they're national parks or wilderness areas, tends to be one of those correlates. Another issue is around how much development rings a national park. And so essentially what we're getting at is this, and I will explain this graph a little bit, is that as the size of the fragment, as, as let's say if it's greater, if it's Yellowstone National Park, Yellowstone is actually part of a bigger core area of wilderness and forest lands. But as humans continue to um, develop in that area, the actual amount of core area declines, and so the, the size of the area declines. And you can also get some increasing fragmentation. Um, and ultimately what happens as you go down towards this side is you lose species and you increasingly um, destroy, destroy different types of communities of habitat. Okay, we got through that, thanks. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk a lot about, and I already have a little bit, but I'm going to talk about um, these issues with, with regards to Yellowstone National Park because it's the world's very first national park. And, and I can't talk about Yellowstone National Park without talking about Grand Teton National Park because, in fact, they sort of form one greater core. And not only that, um, here's Yellowstone National Park and Grand Teton, they actually are part of a bigger system, much of which is protected, that some people call the Greater Yellowstone Ecosystem. Um, and about 25% of that is private land. It turns out if you look at this, and again scientists like to look at patterns, that most of our public lands here, as in the United States and around the world, is actually rock and ice. It's high elevation stuff. Um, and that the lowland private valley bottoms um, you know, are a very different ecosystem and it turns out that they're important for wildlife. So there are lots of different species in, in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem and in fact many say that more or less, um, it's remained intact and all the species are there. This is, these are pronghorn. They live um, in both parks and in the larger ecosystem, and they're by no means an endangered species. There are more pronghorn in the state of Wyoming than there are people. Um, <laughs> but it turns out that if you look at pronghorn in the system, that, um, that migrations as a phenomena 
that maintain species in these high elevation parks are disappearing. And I'm sorry that this orange didn't come out so well, but 75% of the migrations of pronghorn in, in this region have already been lost. Um, and so my point is, is that no matter, you know, the, you know, the Greater Yellowstone ecosystem is 27 million acres, um, and within that there's pri some private lands, but that's a phenomenal amount of acreage in one sort of so-called ecosystem, and yet species are, and, and, and processes like migration are being lost. And Bob is going to talk a little bit more about um, one that, um, moves in and out of Grand Teton National Park and, and the challenge that the park has because they're mandated with maintaining the species in their park. So you'll hear more about that story later today. But I want to talk about another species. This is the cute, cuddly wolverine, which it turns out I watched um, knock down six scientists, so it's not so cute and cuddly. But, um, but again, using the, the Yellowstone uh, Greater Yellowstone Ecosystem, here's Yellowstone National Park. If you look at a species like this, how does it relate to 27 million acres? Well, it turns out that we caught one wolverine here in Grand Teton National Park, and it decided in about a two-week period to go down to Pocatello, Idaho, and have breakfast. It then returned um, and went up to Gardner and came back down, and that, that whole trip was um, about six weeks. And this is a 30-pound individual. This is the discovery part of science. Isn't that cool? Um, it turns out it runs faster than I do when I pretend to run marathons. Um, and then it went over to the Wind River Range, the Wyoming Range, and up to the Centennials where it was legally harvested in Montana, um, all in a period of a few months. So this animal used a substantial, one individual used a substantial part of 27 million acres of the Greater Yellowstone ecosystem. Wow. Okay, so, so let me back up a second and say that science really used to focus on sort of tiny little areas, and then it started, to, you know, looking at a couple of individuals, and then it looked at whole populations. And now um, you're seeing a transformation of, of how we look at systems, in part because of technologies. And so here's another wolverine that we caught up in Yellowstone um, in Grand Teton National Park. And it um, took about six weeks for it to move. 500 miles to become the first wolverine in Colorado since 1919. Um, so what does that mean? So how do we manage wolverines? It means that we literally can't manage on the scale of Yellowstone National Park or Grand Teton National Park, but that we have to manage on a completely different scale than we originally were prepared to. Peter mentioned that we sort of we're, you know, we in, in the United States were sort of the, the ones that sort of created protected areas to manage species, and now we really know that protected areas aren't adequate. Um, so we, you know, what can science help us to do to think about managing across large jurisdictional boundaries? I'm going to talk a little bit about the role of landscape ecology and one of the tools that are out there. Again, I'm not going to talk about a lot of tools. It happens that I'm a corridor ecologist, so I'm going to focus on connectivity. Um, this map, um, each of those colorful blobs is something called a landscape conservation cooperative, which the federal government designated as the scale at which they want to look at um, at climate change and ecological systems and processes and management of these systems. This is a huge transformation. Um, this is not how the federal government has managed lands or wildlife in the past. What's really interesting to me about this, and in fact exciting as a scientist, is that they're following scientific principles. They're saying, in order for us to conserve what we, you know, our natural heritage in this country, we have to look at much larger scales. And in fact, we as the federal government and the state governments and the county governments and private landowners are going to have to work together to make this happen. So clearly, we're not going to just, you know, set aside all of those lands. Um, we can't do that. So how do we work across different levels of protected lands and private lands and different kinds of uses? One of those tools is connectivity. Um, and you're going to hear a lot of terms tossed around in terms of connectivity, everything from linkages 
to ecological corridors, to greenways, to wildlife movement areas, highway underpasses, and so on. Um, so I'm going to offer you two definitions just to make sure we all stay on the same page. One is the definition of connectivity. So connectivity is the measure of the extent to which plants and animals can move between habitat patches. Okay? So movement might be a movement of, from, of a species that runs from you know, core area A to core area B, or movement by, might be for either an animal or a plant, um, the connection over many generations. So actually living within that connectivity zone. Landscape features, in contrast, are actually the, you know, the things, the corridors, the green belts, the linkages, the ecological networks that are the means in order to, to achieve that kind of connectivity. Okay, so this is a, a simplified sketch. You know, you might have a core habitat for a species that you've identified here and one over here. And the matrix is sort of the less, uh, the less uh, utilized habitat. Um, for species like birds and migratory birds, we've done a great job at creating a refuge system up and down their flyways in order for them to have stopover sites between their wintering range and their summering range. For other species, um, sessile organisms like plants and also for you know, uh, species that use their feet to move, Continuous corridors might be what they need if they need to be able to move between patches. Now remember, um, going back to metapopulation theory, um, one of the, th the bases for metapopulation theory, one of the things that it sort of says is the more connected it is, the more likely that that species of interest is likely to be able to survive in either patch. And the reason for that is, let's say, you know, something happens here, there's a big fire, and it recovers over time animals from this patch might be able to move back in there if there's connectivity. Oops, somehow I zoomed ahead. Um, there we go. So that's a pretty simplified look at the world. But there are actually, from a scientific perspective, there are a couple things you have to think about in order to, to think about large landscape conservation and connectivity. One is, what's the scale of data? What's the resolution of your data that you're looking at? Uh, and that's going to say a lot about what you end up doing or prioritizing, what's your spatial area of interest, and what's the temporal scale? Let me talk about this for a second. So the resolution of data. I'm from Montana, so I chose this map. Here's Bozeman. According to this very coarse scale map, um, mountain lions live in Bozeman, which actually occasionally they do, and that also means the police have to come to school and help the kids get in safely. But, um, but really, it's not core habitat. A map of this scale is not going to help us to figure out where the important connectivity areas are for wildlife. So we would need something that's a lot more fine scale. Um, similarly, um, and I want to get into semantics for a second. Are there any geographers in the room? No, OK, good. Uh, we can make fun of them for a second. They talk about large scale as meaning a small study area, which is exactly opposite to the common vernacular of large scale, referring to a large study area. So I get away from that, and I use finer scale and coarser scale, which doesn't resolve everything, but it resolves some of it. Um, this is the human footprint um, map that you saw earlier. Now, again, like with the, the, the mountain lion data, trying to plan corridors based on this scale data, let's say just in the United States, probably wouldn't be a good idea. And so you can do what Jillian Woolmer did here, and she actually took local data and made a much more fine scale map of human footprints in order to do planning in the two countries, one forest region. So the extent of what you, how you see things is also really important. And in fact, I would argue that starting at a fairly large extent is really useful. Um, so you're going to hear from Harvey Locke tomorrow a very interesting story about the Yellowstone to Yukon and the need for this sort of large vision in order to do local, local action conservation. Um, and there's lots of examples of this around the world. I pointed to the landscape conservation cooperatives that the, the US government is promoting, but also Paseo Pantera is all about um, connectivity in, in Latin America, and uh, Aust uh, Alps to Atherton is a, is a 
uh, continental wide corridor that's being promoted by the federal government in Australia. So lots of these kinds of large spatial extents. But the reality is, again, when you get to action and how you implement science, it actually needs to happen on a local level. And I'll talk a little bit about how things like underpasses and overpasses can get identified using science. But this is just to talk about the issues of scale when you're thinking about how to think about large landscape conservation. Another issue about scale is that you kind of have to pick what species you care about or what systems you care about in order um, to conserve what you're trying to conserve. So for California newts, um, this is a road crossing sign that um, is, is in the Berkeley foothills and is really about a specific road and closing of a road that enables the species to migrate from their wetlands to their upland habitat. For mountain lions, we talked about the example of Montana, and you know, maybe planning on that sort of scale could be useful. But for something like this Arctic turn that goes from Antarctica to Alaska, um, you, know, you literally have to plan on a global scale. So I also want to think about scale in the context of landscape. And Peter set me up really well for this. Um, there are, there are, you know, and, and I'm a huge proponent of connectivity of landscapes in general. But when it comes to fine scale issues, and in fact, Bob and I were at a conference just earlier this week talking about, is it appropriate to reconnect forests and interior parks in Los Angeles? What are the benefits and what are the costs? Do you want mountain lions in downtown Los Angeles? Um, but likewise, do you want black bears really to become dumpster divers? So when do you want to have discontinuity um, in corridors? And one of them might be um, with something like a cutthroat trout, where you know, it's a, you know, it's extremely endangered animal, and in fact, increasing connectivity right now for this species might lead to genetic de degradation because it's inbreeding with non native um, uh, animals that have been put into those waters. And so you might have cases where you want to see purposeful discontinuity for s specific scenarios and sp for specific species. The other issue of scale is looking not just at today, but looking at the future. And this is a map. Um, and what I want you to pay attention to is this is Sonoma Mountain in Sonoma County. And there's, you know, you could kind of picture that these, these um, darker areas are sort of um, where a set of carnivores are more likely to occur. And, and in fact, you know, there's some continuity here. But if you look at future development scenarios, Sonoma Mountain really becomes isolated. And so that might help you in terms of looking at um, where you might either focus your conservation um, so that it doesn't become an isolated habitat or make other decisions on land use. Another scalar issue is temporal issues. So. Um, my colleague Lisa Gromlick said to me, you know, I really don't understand what the problem is with people being worried about these mega forest fires in the West. During the last interglacial, you know, all of the forests burned up in the West. This isn't a new phenomenon. We're not going to have forests. Big deal. Well, the big deal is, is that we're here now, so <laughs> we actually do have to think about it. Um, but there's a real challenge there because those are sort of, you know, uh, that's a very different time scale than most of the ecological studies that happen, which is less than four years. And so how do you match sort of these short-term studies with longer-term perspectives? Another issue is what kinds of data um, you, you use in terms of your planning, and I'll talk about what, what I mean by that in a second, and the time scale that you might want something to function. So let's take grizzly bears. A lot of people, most Americans I would argue, think of grizzly bears as sort of mountain species because where are they found? Mountains, right? Well, actually, and wouldn't it have been cool to see, you know, Los Angeles or the Bay Area out there, you know, eating sea lions and things like that, that might have been their prime habitat. If you use the historical context as a restorative sort of baseline versus today's context, you might, and only looking at where they are at now and trying to save what's there, you might come out with very different outcomes. So again, looking at the context of your data is really important. Similarly, ecosystems change. Fires happen, sand dunes drift, um, and so 
One can, and I always think about this, in China I went and was working on a golden monkey project and they wanted to conserve the golden monkeys right where they're at. It turns out that they eat lichen and that it takes them about 50 years to deplete lichen in one place and then they need to move on. Well, we could draw a reserve around where they currently are and what would they do in 50 years? That's right. Okay, so I'm going to just talk a little bit more about some examples of moving science into implementation. This is kind of a fun part. All right, so Northwest Montana, Highway 93. From the human perspective, you can look at bumper stickers that used to say, pray for me, I drive Highway 93. Very dangerous highway went through the Flathead Reservation, single lane, people went really fast, a lot of drinking. From the wildlife perspective, pancake. Um, so... Um, a little bit just on the background of this, if it hadn't been for the tribes, the Confederated Salish and Kootenai, this wouldn't have happened. Um, the the um, Department of Transportation came in and said, we're going to save humans. We're going to twin this highway, and it's going to be great. And, and the tribes said, wait a minute. What about our cultural resources, including our wildlife heritage? And they went back and forth for about five years until the Department of Transportation signed a memorandum of understanding discussing and, and recognizing wildlife heritage as an important component. And what that led to was arguably one of the most progressive wildlife crushing structures in the United States. In a, about a 57 mile length of highway, there were going to be over 40 wildlife crossing structures. And most of those have been put in today. You can drive it and see it. Um, but how do you figure out where to put those wildlife crossing structures? Um, it turns out that you can do a number of things. You can look at um, the historical data on wildlife being killed, right? So bigger circles, turns out, means that more species have been killed in those areas over time. Um, and in fact, there was a group of school kids that used to go out every year and collect um, painted turtles. And they, co they collected 500 each year on the roads that had been smashed, um, which has now been fixed um, thanks to this work. You can also look at where animals are currently crossing the road. So this is a tribal member, Whisper uh, Camel, who um, continues to monitor this. And these are, she's raking this area in order to detect what kinds of species are crossing where on the highway. A phenomenal amount of work. And you can see the very useful measuring stick and, and um, <laughs> some bear prints. Um, and, and it turns out that that can really help inform what are the wildlife seeing as they approach the road and how can that help us to figure out where to put these wildlife crossings. Um, they have put in one overpass uh, in addition to the underpasses and Whisper and her colleagues have continued to monitor this in the last couple of years um, and, and they've already seen grizzly bears and bighorn sheep and deer and many, many other species using these wildlife crossing structures. Um, and a really neat point about this is up in um, Banff, the hometown of Harvey, um, they have been monitoring such structures for about 15 years. And it turns out that, you know, if you just look at the first five years of use, the story is really different than if you look 15 years later. It takes the animals a while to learn. I'm going to take you a little bit further north to a place called Nahani National Park. Um, Nahani is... Um, this dark area was the original park right here. And it was created specifically to protect a really amazing waterfall. Um, but it turns out that um, a while back, the, the, uh, Canada decided that their parks should um, encompass something called ecological integrity, whatever that is, right? Um, well, it turns out that there's some, some nice parameters around that and that they wanted to, to begin to look at what that was. And so they hired this guy um, from, from my organization, uh, John Weaver, to work with um, Environment Canada as well as um, uh, the Satu and the Decho First Nations up there who really wanted to see some conservation happen on their lands and to begin to get at how big would a park need to be if it was going to sustain animals that um, are native in that region. This is a grizzly bear going underneath a barbed wire fence to do a non-invasive kind of um, sampling to figure out where grizzly bears occur and um, how big the population was. And so it turns out that they leave this nice hair. And you can get all sorts of information today from hair. This is sort of the new technology that has really transformed, or another new technology that has really transformed um, ecology. You can get, you know, the, whether it's male or female, 
what kind of species it is, um, its individual identity, and how it's related to the other species in your study. And so John um, did work on grizzly bears and doll, and, and as well as doll sheep and woodland caribou with um, a number of other scientists and came up with these maps, okay? And the, the colored areas are the important areas that were identified by these different studies um, in relation to the park. Um, and, and what you can see is that actually much larger areas are needed if you want to sustain these kinds of populations of species. And so... Um, the good news is, is that this was the scientific basis for what Canada decided as the first part of extending um, the park to being six times bigger than it was or three times bigger than Yellowstone National Park. Again, using science to define what kind of conservation we might need. Now let me return to a more humanized system. You might recognize this. This area right here is Yellowstone, Greater Yellowstone Ecosystem that I talked about earlier. Salmon Selway as a core habitat for uh, many species. And the Glacier uh, Bob Marshall area is a third sort of core habitat. So returning to the story of wolverines, we know that if we just save this area, and we do everything exactly right for wolverines, we're only going to sustain a population of about 40 wolverines, not viable over the long term. And so the western states got together um, with federal state agencies and others to sort of talk about what that would mean just in this particular system. And they said, aha, based on the science, what we know we need to do is think about this linkage area. Well, the linkage area is sort of that messy area of a mix of public lands, state lands, federal lands, private lands, it's a whole slew of things. So what do we do there? So um, my organization started looking at this place and looking, you know, first at a valley level. Madison Valley Ranchlands Group wanted to know, they wanted to not become Bozeman. And so they wanted to maintain their wildlife heritage as part of that. We did a conservation assessment. And one of the things we came up with is, okay, here are three places you might want to think about maintaining connectivity for species that need to move between the mountain range that link either side of Madison. And I'll show you where Madison County is in a second in that context. Well, the second thing we wanted to figure out is when you look at large carnivores that are sort of beginning to spill out of the greater Yellowstone ecosystem, the less loved wolf and grizzly bear and other more loved species like wolverines, you know, how are they spilling out of the system? And um, so we looked at a place called the Centennials, which um, down here is a, is a little show, show. And we can begin to see how animals are, are using this system. And in fact, um, begin to predict what the most important parts of this area are for these different kinds of species. And, and, and we can have local impacts. But it turns out that if you look just at that scale, um, let me show you where we were looking at. This was Madison and this was the Centennials. That's a really small chunk of a larger area that we have to think about if we're really truly going to be successful at connecting these areas. Well, the, one of the great things about science, of course, is that we can model. We can take those kinds of data and then we can put these into models and begin to figure out on a much more uh, broad region, how would these animals begin to move? And this is a circuitscape model that's just actively being worked on with Scott and others um, to look at you know, how, do, how what, what would be the priorities? Because clearly this is a working landscape. We want to make sure that it can continue to be a working landscape, and we only, we, but we want to make sure that we minimize wildlife conflict and allow connectivity between these areas. And there's this pesky thing called livelihoods. Turns out that people watch the river runs through it and they each want to buy a chunk of it. Um, it. Science can, and I won't talk about it right now, but science can look at sort of what are the relative impacts of taking, let's say, 50 houses and spreading them across the landscape versus doing some sort of cluster development. Um, does it make a difference? At what scale would it make a difference? Turns out that another part of livelihoods is, is cultural perceptions. And so there's a whole social science arena, and we've hired social scientists to look at what, we're, you know, what are our tolerance levels. Because you can pick one of those great corridors that we identified earlier, but you might not get anywhere if you have really these kinds of sentiments out there. Um, and in fact, there's a whole mess of stakeholders that you have to think about when you look at a region this large. And these are just some examples of these kinds of stakeholders.
Um, what's really cool, and I'm really excited about this, is we can begin to develop maps of sort of cultural um, desires, if you will. And this is an example map, um, one from the Big Hole, um, which is a part of that uh, linkage zone, and one from Island Park, another part of the linkage zone. And in fact, um, the areas, th this particular map is the areas that were identified by these communities, both private landowners and public officials, that were important for conservation. And you can see the purple areas, wow. Big Hole actually has a really strong conservation ethic. Um, and they think a lot of that area is really important for conservation. And Island Park is a little bit more spotty. But that's interesting to know, and that can really help in terms of being able to be successful in doing conservation. Um, and, it, and what you can do, and I won't show you here because we haven't gotten there yet, this is very new stuff, is you can take sort of um, spatial biological priorities and intersect them with human interests and, and get get to sort of what, where are the places that are going to be the best bang for your buck, um, where you can work well with communities and also um, achieve um, important biological triggers. I'm going to stop there with examples, and I'm going to um, shift gears just briefly and talk about what are the future science needs out there, given sort of where we know, where we know conservation is going to this large landscape scale um, uh, and, and what, what do we really need to answer? And I'm going to just say th four things. There's many more out there. One of them is we need to be monitoring. This country, um, despite its great resources, has not done a good job of es establishing a monitoring system. This is particularly important given the rapid changes from humans as well as a rapidly changing climate. Um, the second that I think we would benefit from is more emphasis in looking at ecosystem services. Before we put in a dam and we pay that huge amount of money, could we get those services for a lot cheaper using something else, using beavers, using other types of free eco ecosystem services? Um, you know, clearly we need more research that's, you know, multi-scale and multidisciplinary if we're going to work across these very complicated landscapes. And the last thing is that we need to know a lot more, um, not necessarily about climate change, but about the tools for moving us forward because just about every agency is paralyzed with what to do given what they see as the documented changes as well as the, for the less certain forecasted changes. Um, I'll just mention, you know, one example of sort of what kind of tools we might need given the climate changing arena. You know, we, we talked about these fixed protected area boundaries and the need for con connectivity, and it's in fact the most recommended uh, tool in the science literature to address climate change. But here are some of the challenging issues that I'll just leave you to ponder. You know, if you have one quarry and it becomes two, you might need a new linkage. Or, um, over here, you might have your core area move and your, your linkage might change, or your linkage might be transformed by different things happening in the environment. How do we deal with these going forward if we're to have a long-term robust system that protects our biodiversity and provides services for us as humans? So I'll close just by saying that, to me, science is about ins inspiration. It, it provides analysis and tools that help to guide us forward as we do our conservation into the future. And with that, I'll take questions. Thank you. My question is, we saw how kit foxes can live in the suburbs, and we saw how pronghorn often don't migrate. And my question is, if a kit fox no longer knows how to hunt or can hunt, or if a pronghorn doesn't migrate, is it the same animal? And are we preserving them in the way envisioned by the ESA? Great question. And I'm going to talk to you about this in the context of bison. There are 500,000 bison in this country. Only 20,000 of them are genetically pure, free-ranging, and doing what bison do, ecologically functional. Some people, and in fact it's being proposed for listing on the ESA, what, you know, is, is a bison a bison if it's not out there interacting with its environment? 
from a science perspective, we would, you know, there, there's, there's sort of the minimum to retain the genetic composition of a species, but there's another level out there, which isn't actually addressed by the ESA, which is, is it functioning? Is it an ecologically functional population um, such that it can, it can remember predator-prey dynamics, such that um, it can, in the case of bison, it creates wallows that other species depend on, that it interacts with prairie dog colonies and the declining uh, grassland species. And, and so there's a very different marker out there. It's not one, you know, it's a relatively new concept, not that it hasn't been there for a while, but it's still, I think, being defined. Um, but it's a really important concept to think about. Thanks. Um, interested in your view on uh, landscape conservation cooperatives, um, you know, really interesting tool from a science perspective. And what's your view on starting to roll that out into the social and cultural arena and get people living in communities thinking about you know, managing their lands that way. Certainly there's probably some upsides and some downsides of that. That's a huge question. Um, it's going to be under-resourced if you look at the federal agency's um, funding right now. Um, I guess the one thing that I would say, I'm going to talk about my hope more than anything. Um, I think the ESA is a very powerful tool. Um, I would like to see the same types of powerful tool developed on the incentive side. So I'm a parent, you know, if you hit your kid on the head with a hammer enough times they're going to ignore it, right? What can we do that provides incentives to do the right thing? And there are some incentives tools out there, but I'd like to see stronger and better tools out there because it is hard to live with wolves. It is hard to live with grizzly bears and we ought to be complimenting and thanking folks rather than, than um, suggesting they're not doing it well enough. That's a human, that's a value, not a science statement. Again, uh, Dan Potts, uh, Salt Lake County Fish and Game Association. You, uh, Jody, you, ex you expressed the uh, need for uh, monitoring, but one thing I noticed from the public side is that agencies are extremely hesitant to allow the, uh, the public to participate in, in, in monitoring efforts because we're simply not deemed experts or whatever. You know, is that a wolverine or whatever? So. You know, it's interesting that you say that. Um, what I've seen in the last 10 years is actually a real increase in citizen monitoring. Um, and I think that's a really helpful tool for a couple of reasons. Um, you know, today, um, you know, kids recognize more fast food restaurants than they do birds in their backyard. And so getting kids out there for that kind of monitoring and adults out there is enormous. The second piece of that is if you look at the, the bird monitoring, which is all volunteer, um, and the, the incredible bird data sets that are going on, they're really rich sources to begin to understand some of the trends, like you know, the influencing changes of climate and so forth. I think I'm going to have to end here, but I'd be happy to chat further with uh, any of you at break. Thank you. <laughs>